Welcome back and welcome to our next session. Smart Systems for Health and Active Living. The chairman of this session is Rainer Günstler. He is head of business development at Hart Schickert, EPOS member and host of this event. Please, Mr. Günstler. Thanks, Evelyn. Uh, before we actually start with the presentations, I would like uh, to have some words uh, to you. Well, Alberto already said a lot. I think there's um, not much to add from EPOS side. I appreciate very much that EPOS community, uh, that the EPSI community is also doing real projects that we are also doing in EPOS. Um, but of course, uh, it is good to have such a good occasion like this forum to get to know each other a little bit more. Uh, but uh, real projects, they don't fall from the blue sky. Uh, we need to come closer to, together. And to facilitate this, I would like to take the chance, more or less spontaneously, to invite everybody who is interested in a deeper discussion, in a maybe more um, um, smaller round. Um, we will have our next um, working group meeting for healthy living on 13th of October. Healthy Living is a working group, um, one of the six or seven working groups in EPOS. And actually, uh, the first bullet point describing the uh, fields of activity of this working group is called preventing disease and promoting fitness and healthy lifestyles. Then, of course, we are concerned with medical devices, care diagnostics, monitoring for chronic diseases, and so on. So everybody who is interested to join the next working group meeting, which is on 13th of October, a bit less than two weeks from now, please drop me a short email, um, which also could contain some ideas uh, on what to discuss. And if you cannot remember my name, just uh, give the email to the EPOS office. Thanks. That's it. Um, and I will give back to Evelyn now. Thank you, Mr. Günzler, for this introduction. I would like to welcome now our first speaker in the session, Jan Mitrovic. He's founder and CEO of JLM, JLM Innovation, and he is an expert in span sensor technology, software development systems, and electronics design, data analysis, and pattern recognition. Moreover, JLM Innovation is an owner of the EPOS SSI trademark for the smart product Sniffphone. You have the floor, Mr. Mitrovic. Thank you for the kind introduction. I hope you can hear me and probably now you could also see me. Oh, yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, just a few words about JLM Innovation before we deep dive into the uh, breath analysis. So um, the company uh, was founded in 2004 with the core mission to bring scientific research to real life applications. And uh, we do this by using our uh, experience and building blocks for chemical sensors, uh, developing uh, product prototypes that meet application demands. Um, very often within research projects, our role is therefore to build the prototype and that then gets into, uh, into extensive testing throughout the project. But we're also working with companies to develop products that, that then go to market, introducing uh, a new, uh, new scientific technology into products and helping them to make the tr uh, transition from academic research to uh, commercial exploitation. Uh, so, um, let me see, yeah. So uh, uh, just a few words on, on uh, Excel breath analysis. This is a field that's, uh, that has, growing, uh, has seen growing attention over the past years uh, or past 10, 15 years. Uh, it's a very, very old um, 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 field. Uh, already the old Greeks knew that um, um, as, as Hippocrates said that you should smell your patient uh, as our, our metabolism will create uh, distinct patterns in the breath if we are diseased, if we're undergoing uh, certain stages of, 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 uh, um, of our life. So, um, and we all know that people smell differently depending on their state, of, uh, depending on diseases and dogs can be used in all sorts of, of applications there. But to make that practical, of course, you need instrumentation. 
Uh, and uh, there is a lot of uh, technical um, analytical instrumentation, lab instrumentation that, of course, can be used for, for gas measurements. And those are typically also used uh, to identify uh, individual specific VOCs um, uh, that then are re uh, related to diseases. And uh, in that case, we call them a biomarker for a disease. And I'll, I'll just show in the next slide a couple of examples. But I, I need to also talk about what changes if we're using sensor arrays. If we're using sensor arrays, those arrays are not specific to individual VOCs, but they're responding to the whole pattern of VOCs that are exhaled. And therefore, we're going away from the individual VOC to uh, a more, more general um, uh, picture, looking at the sensor responses as a result of the exhaled breath. And that's, that, that has some additional impl imp, uh, implication that we'll see throughout the talk. So uh, these are a couple of examples of commercially available breath tests that, that um, uh, some of you will know. Uh, I think the first one, uh, almost everybody knows, that's the typical breath test, uh, a breathalyzer uh, that's used to measure alcohol in the exhaled breath. And therefore, you can calculate the um, blood alcohol level um, as there's a, a ratio between the level of alcohol exhaled and the level that is in, in, in in, in the blood. Uh, and that's in wide, uh, widespread use by police. Uh, it has been become a very affordable, affordable very low cost test, so it can be used easily. Uh, there are, of course, uh, other activities to use um, breath analysis or breath test systems for, for um, diseases. One uh, very recent uh, development is the Vivatmo device that Bosch has, re has released, and that's measuring specifically nitric oxide uh, as a, a biomarker for inflammation. Uh, inflammation that typically occurs in the lungs uh, related to asthma and, uh, or COPD. And uh, it's uh, there are distinct levels that can be used uh, to use that as a biomarker. And therefore, then you can take action and take your medicine in order to reduce the inflammation. Another test uh, that is kind of the gold standard to identify Helicobacter pylori in the uh, in the gastric tract is the um, is is an urea test. So uh, urea is marked with uh, uh, with the, with the isotope C13, and then it's it's uh, swallowed by the patient, uh, and the bacteria in the gut can convert that kind of of urea uh, and digest it and uh, uh, the the interesting part is it's only the bacteria that really can do this in our gut. So if you see then as a result of this digestion of the bacteria, CO2 with, a, with the isotope uh, C13, we can relate this to, um, to the um, prevalence of the bacteria in the gut. And the, uh, the device is typically, uh, the test is typically used, you swallow the, uh, the uh, urea test, um, you're exhaling the breath into a bag and then the content of that bag is, is, is measured using a CO2 um, uh, analyzer or an infrared FTIR analyzer that is capable of discriminating between uh, uh, the isotopes of CO2. Um, if we are um, trying to uh, apply a breath analysis to more delicate um, diseases, um, and uh, a lot of our research has been in the area of, of cancer, as of course, uh, early detection of cancer through, a, through an easy to use test is, is, is uh, really a, a worthwhile goal. Um, we see that it's not very easy to, to identify those biomarkers anymore. Well, first of all, um, cancer doesn't affect the whole body, so our body reaction to this is probably smaller. And it's only a ver very small part that would be, um, would be active emitting uh, the specific biomarkers. So the concentrations are very low. Um, and, and therefore, uh, these, uh, these um, BOCs are harder to pick up. And then also, it's a change of the metabolism of specific parts of our body. So what we do typically see, what we're looking for, is not a specific biomarker that only the cancer will produce, but a change of biomarkers in the exhaled breath. And there have been a lot of um, studies um, that have been conducted. And um, 
in in most cases of the, I mean, there are some, there are some biomarkers or some VOCs that that uh, several studies do find, but very often there is not a good um, conclusive picture if you compare um, various um, studies. And uh, so the question is, why is that the case? Uh, and the reason for that is that there is really a huge amount of bio, of VOCs that are potential biomarkers into in our exhaled breath and the number of patients that you can efficiently do in in these uh, studies is limited so it's a statistical problem how do we identify from this uh, huge potential amount of, of different VOC biomarkers um, the ones that are really relevant to the disease uh, especially if, it, if it's typically a change of, of um of those uh, biomarkers uh, in the background of of all the different changes of of patient to patient um, variation. Um, so um, there is there is a dual approach that we typically take in this analysis uh, in these these um, studies. Is we're, we're first of all we're trying to investigate the meta uh, metabolic pathways that lead to those um, VOC changes, but at the other on the other side that still means that we need to perform quite extensive um, clinical uh, studies uh, involving as many patients as we can do, and they also need not only be measured by a relatively straightforward breath analysis test of course we also need the the metadata the real um, um, the, the the true data with established measure, methods so it is quite a large and costly process to to gather that data um, nevertheless uh, what we what we what we've set out for is to make this uh, these tests easier and we've been our role within this project typically is building the instrument uh, instrumentations to um, to do those uh, large-scale testing so um, we have developed a number of instruments that help to do those tests more efficiently and also that helps us to introduce new sensor technologies into this field to perform those tests so one of the platforms that we have developed is what we call our modular breath analyzer it's the it's the outcome essentially of a, of a research project uh, the Volgaco project uh, uh, and um, we have adapted it in a way that uh, we are, first of all we're we're solving the, the the breath sampling process in a consistent way uh, and we've tested that and optimized this over over quite a long time uh, we're using what's called an end tidal or uh, breath sampling which means that the patient is exhaling into a tube um, through a disposable, disposable mouthpiece and then the end tidal part of the breath that's the breath that is coming from the deepest part of your lungs which is most likely to to show um, uh, the relevant VOC patterns uh, you, uh, due to diseases that you find in your body uh, is then sampled into into the sensor chamber and the sensor compartment itself is, is modular so we can employ their different sensor technologies and try out new sensor technologies and use this as, as a platform to introduce it into clinical trials. Um, of course, um, you know, this, this system has been used in, in, a, in a number of clinical trials and we have a nice clinical UI and, and the feedback that we get from the medical practitioners is that what they like about the system is that it is so easy to to perform those tests and so easy to uh, to use it in their in their clinical uh, tests uh, which often is a difference to to a lot of other uh, breath tests that require a lot more exhalations a lot more um, efforts by the patient so that was one of our design goals when designing this, this system to have an, uh, uh, an efficient platform that allows for this testing uh, the other step that we did is that uh, in order to, to increase the amount of testing, it was clear that we needed a more low-cost system. And, and uh, within the, the uh, project Sniffon, we have developed a mobile platform that's battery operated, a small size, small size. I have one of the systems here so I can hold it up in the camera. It's, it's this system, this size. Um, it's, it's essentially fully autonomous. Um, and it allows very efficient testing of patients. Um, it has a number of, of uh, important uh, differentiators to the other systems. It's not only cost and size and mobility, it's also the way that uh, the breath sampling is happening. And uh, what we do in here is that it's not anymore an inhalation into the system, you're breathing towards the system. So there is no physical contact of the patient towards the system. Uh, and, and we're still uh, able to, to measure the relevant part of the breath by 
um, by looking at the uh, at the data. So uh, by looking at the sampling, uh, looking at the sensors uh, that are monitoring the breath. So this system is available and there's of course cloud platform that works with the whole system. And since this was available, when the COVID-19 um, um, uh, took off, uh, it was clear that this system would need to be tested with, with COVID-19. Unfortunately, Hossam Haik, who is our collaborator at the Technion, and they are developing essentially the sensors for this system, is also a professor in, in China. He's lecturing in China and he had the contact and he took it immediately the device to test drive things. And already in March 2020 in Wuhan, we have been able to perform those tests there. And the first um, um, data is out there. Uh, the data looks promising. Um, but of course, there is more more tests to be done now. The numbers of patients are rather small in uh, in China, so the tests are being continued in Israel, who unfortunately have a lot uh, larger numbers at the moment. But uh, the results do really uh, look promising. The core thing here is that the test results are in within three minutes. Um, and you can look at the publications. I've given the reference here if you are uh, deeper interested. Uh, and just to summarize, I would like to uh, to um, outline why I think this is really an important uh, contribution to the field. The real advantage is that it's a very rapid test, a very low cost test. Essentially, we have no consumable consumables if we're if you're using uh, breathe on testing. It's painless. Uh, there's no swaps needed. It's very easy to do, very um, little training required. However, we will not reach the specificity and the sensitivity of a PCR test. So we see this as an additional testing that could be done as a pre-screening test. It's perfect to, to measure large groups, to do a, a access control. Uh, and uh, so, so it's a little bit a body temperature uh, check on steroids. It's giving us much, much better data, uh, but the data still needs to be confirmed in case there is the likeliness of an infection in a person uh, with the real PCR test. Um, so I'd like to uh, give some acknowledgements and outlook. We're also doing now a lot, lot larger systems with more sensors, with testing our systems in, in the Vogas project, um, doing clinical trials in South America and East Germany, uh, East is Europe, Eastern Europe. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of activity going on now. Um, the COVID-19 really has has meant that we had to we had to uh, shift some of our attention into this area, but we're not fully focused on it right now. Uh, as as um, you know, as a small company, we 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 still have to fulfill our tasks and duties. Um, so I'm would like to conclude with this. I think my time is over, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Mantorovic, for this presentation. At this point, I would like to call your attention to the EPOS trademark, Smart System Integrated. EPOS SSI trademark is a collective European Union trademark. It has been registered by the EPOS Association, which has been its owner since 2017 and is managed by MESAP Cluster. The SSI trademark concerns smart systems technologies or innovative products integrating smart systems. The trademark is free of charge for one year for all EPOS members. Please do not hesitate to apply for the EPOS trademark and take advantage of all its benefits. And you can find the details of the newly relaunched trademark website. Now we are looking forward to our following presentation of Christophe Jus. He is Senior Project Manager at business and Business Development Manager at the Swiss Center for Electronics and Microtechnology. And he will give us insights into solutions for 24-7 monitoring of physiological parameters. Please, Mr. Vergeus. We can't hear you right now. I share my screen, but uh, I do not yes, think you see, you, no, you all see is working. the screen. You see the screen, we see you and we hear you. Okay, fine. So I jump on it. So um, my name is Christopher Ryu. I'm working in MedTech at CSEM. CSEM is a not-for-profit research and technology organization supported by the Swiss government. And we have a strong heritage uh, on Swiss watchmakers. 
our mission, like uh, all the RTOs, uh, most of them, is to develop and transfer technology to the industrial sector. And now I'm going to present you uh, Digital Health and CSEM, and more precisely, the technology platform we develop for 24-7 uh, monitoring of uh, physiological parameter. So, thanks to our uh, heritage of uh, watchmaking, so that's uh, more of uh, 30 years of experience in miniaturization, uh, low power, and uh, ergonomics as well. Um, we have the perfect background for wearable and 24-7 monitoring. So, here you see some body location where we have been working. Uh, so, it's not only watches, you can see also uh, glasses, but uh, we don't work uh, on the we work only on the sensor level, let's say. We, we don't work on the visualization. Uh, wearables, of course, they belong to the physical layer. And speaking about digital health, CSEM is also active in the, in the service, in the application layer, and in, in privacy and, and security. So we started uh, before 2000, our activity in uh, consumer sports and wellness. And then in 2014, we did the ISO 13485 certification. So we are now also focusing on medical device development. Uh, you see here uh, the health topic uh, or the main health topic we, we are working on. And uh, we have a complete catalog of, of vital signs. You can see cardiovascular, uh, EEG, also step distance, all these things. So this is based on, on technology platform, which are like systems. So we work on the sensor, we work on the electronics, we work also on the algorithm. So usually 60 to 304 class B or C, and if we are talking about medical, and also uh, on integration. And all this know-how on IP is actually licensed in several products, but we are of course open to further licensing to, to other partners. This is our business model. And you can see also some of the hospital we are collaborating with for our clinical trials, of course. And uh, I will now present you the technology platform we, we developed to be able to monitor these different vital signs. So there are six platforms, uh, human kinetics, uh, photoplethysmography, PPG, uh, what we call the cooperative sensor, smart medical system integration, uh, optical gas sensing, and electrochemical sensors. So the first technology platform is uh, human kinetics, so mainly based on, on accelerometers. And here we have uh, activity classification, speed distance, all that. So we have a, a library with a lot of algorithms licensed in, in several products. Uh, the latest one is the Decathlon Swim, so it will be out uh, in November this year on the market. And Decathlon, in this case, they compared our performance with Garmin and decided to license our, our algorithms. So that's on the sports side. Uh, and more on the medical side, today, uh, big area is elderly and we are focusing on, on fall detection and, and fall prediction. Quite active on that. Um, the second platform is uh, photoplethysmography, PPG. So uh, we started with the heart rate. So now we also have all the hardware platform. We have experience in benchmarking the optical module. We're doing the control of the analog front end and uh, still benchmark all the solution on the market. Um, so from the HR, we, we moved into what uh, I call uh, interbit interval. So the equivalent of the R interval from the ECG. And here you see the accuracy of our current algorithm, which is better than five milliseconds if we compare to the ECG. So just for an optical sensor. And um, uh, we, from the uh, IBI, we also have the HRV, the sleep profiling and the respiration. And here you have also an example on the corner, uh, bottom uh, right, of uh, AVA. That's one of uh, the product integrating our technology. Uh, it's a fertility tracker of a woman. And they compared it in a sleep lab uh, with polysomnography study. And the breathing rate, so measured at the wrist with an optical uh, sensor, was better than one respiration per minute. Uh, we have also been working uh, on uh, atrial fibrillation, SpO2, so blood oxygenation. Here you have an example of monitoring at the thorax for the Open Space Agency. And uh, so all this library are usually also developed according to 62304 class B or C because we have many medical applications. Um, then from uh, the hair trait, we moved also into the analysis of the shape of the pulse 
what is called pulse wave analysis. And we developed algorithm for uh, optical uh, measurement of blood pressure. And we are currently transferring this technology into several uh, products. And you have here two examples of use case. The one is the smartphone camera. And the second use case is at the wrist, so Actia. It's a startup or like a spin-off because actually several of our ex-colleagues built this, this startup a couple of years ago. Um, the third technology platform now, it's what we call cooperative sensor. So it's focusing on uh, ECG, impedance and EEG. So of course we also work on standard architecture, but uh, our uh, technology, it's actually with two main features. You have dry active electrodes, so you can see here uh, compared with gel is quite good and this active dry electrode is also very good for, for motion. And the second point is, is a bus connection. So we work with one or two wire bus depending on the application. And uh, so you can have a textile with only one or two layers of, of conductive layers and you can measure with that uh, 12 EDCG or even go to 200 if you want to do imaging or an EEG. So the advantage is not only the ergonomy, but also the manufacturing cost because you are saving all the cables and connection and all that. And we can do that with one battery per sensor or, or one battery for all. So talking about many electrodes, uh, so if you see something like this, the interest is also for imaging. So here we have an example of electro impedance tomography where you inject current and you see the, 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 the impedance and then you, you change from one to the next. And with that, you can actually uh, do this image of the thorax and you can see here a shallow breathing and a deep breathing and you can exactly see the lines and all that. And this is just with a shirt with just a, a belt of sensor. And if you look at afterwards at the right pixel with that, you can also work on pulmonary arterial pressure. And that's what we're doing also right now. Um, the fourth platform is more uh, a competence. So I know we are in smart system integration, but we do also smart medical system integration. And uh, I have three examples. So you have a uh, insulin pump, which is class 2B. Uh, you have a wearable controller for implantable passive pump, that's for lymph application, this is class 3. And uh, what we are doing right now is working uh, uh, on an implantable EEG, so it's implanted under the scalp for long-term monitoring, uh, typically a couple of years uh, for patients with epilepsy. So this is a class three uh, medical device. Um, the platform number five, uh, it's actually optical gas sensing. So oxygen uh, using fluorescence quenching or uh, CO2 using absorption. So we actually encapsulate dye into a nanoporous matrix. And uh, this is our patented technology and the technology we developed, uh, the technology and the processes is actually increasing lifetime, sensitivity, response time, and it's also very robust to humidity. So if you look at application now, uh, of course, we can think of respiration monitoring, capnography. We are also monitoring uh, uh, in cell sculpture or bioreactor. You have an example of bone growth on the, on the bottom right. And uh, you can see it also on the plane, we do pressure sensitive paint. So I mentioned the response time. Here you have the response time of uh, better than 10 kilohertz. So it's actually very fast and, and you can measure this kind of changes. Uh, the last platform, uh, electrochemical uh, sensor. So we use it for uh, sweat, uh, urine or, or saliva monitoring. And here you have two examples. First one is uh, urine analysis. So you have examples here of the pH. And another one for sports is uh, sweat monitoring. So during exercise, so you can see here uh, sweat volume, sodium, potassium and, and pH. And um, so that was uh, the all the platform I presented. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Vergis. I am now eager to the presentation of Jos Arts. He is program leader of wearable healthcare at Maastricht University in the Faculty of Health, Medicine and Life Sciences. He will talk about mobilization and activation of people with technical and or activities specialty needs. So have the floor, Mr. Martz. Hello. Good morning. Um, 
still trying to share my screen. Um, where can I select which on screen? The, on, I the top, want? on the top, there's the display settings. Yeah. You can swap it. Well, it says already. Ah, it shows. No. There are uh, three options on the on the top. Left, there's show taskbar, and the second. Uh, yes, we can see your screen already. This is Carlo talking, um, but we see the presenters mode. So please uh, go on to the display settings in the top. Display settings in the top. Of the, not in go to webinar tool. In PowerPoint, you see the black window presenters mode. Oh. Yep. Um, and you have to go up now. We see the presenters mode. Oh. You have to swap the this presenters. One? Yeah, and uh, we see this one, and you go up to display, display setting. Thank you. And swap. Yep, Thanks. wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, uh, my name is Jos Art. Oops. Do I have to minimize this? Do you only see the screen? We see or a presentation it... right right now. Okay. That's perfectly. Wow. Let's... Okay. Well, my name is Jos Arts. I'm working at Maastricht University in the Netherlands, and I'm very happy to be able to tell you something about our developments related to the mobilization and activation of people with special needs. I will show you a short video of these developments soon, but first let me tell me why I think that it's important that we are all here today. The main reason, of course, is that these developments require the cooperation of a lot of partners. But specifically, unlike for large-scale consumer-oriented projects, for people with special needs and their care professional, it is very important to include them in the development process, because otherwise, to my opinion, these people will never benefit from all the technology that we will develop together. And I will focus on that a little later, but first I will show you a little video of the applications that I'm talking about. So, please could you show the video? Just a second. Let's introduce the MOX Activity Monitor. This monitor is developed with and for medical researchers. The MOX is used in different applications. In this case, the elderly people wear the MOX during their daily life at home. The dedicated algorithm registers their daily activity. The MISS Activity gives feedback about their personal movement behavior. In hospitals, Physiotherapists use the MOX to monitor patients. The personal approach of the physiotherapist in combination with the objective data from the hospital fit application provides the best combination for a swift recovery. The ultimate goal was to develop a smaller, lighter, more flexible and wireless MOX. The improved and more energy efficient PCB in combination with a wireless charging module and a super thin battery resulted in a fully working prototype. Would you like to use the MOX for your research? Contact us for more information. Now I'm unmuted again. And you can still see the screen, right? Right because I see myself very big. Okay. The purpose of the first application, which was called the MOX, is to support elderly to achieve their recommended amount of daily physical activity. And indeed, many fitness tractors are already available on the market. However, research at Z University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands showed that working with all the features of these wearables uh, with all the features that these wearables provide is way too complex for these people. Therefore, based on a usability study by 
desired university together with the end users, we've developed an activity tracker that fulfills all the special needs of these users related to both the device interaction, right? And also related to information feedback, making it more easy for them to use. Then in the second application, the hospital fit, which re, uh, function is to support the recovery of hospitalized patients after surgery. During this phase, it is certainly way too early to provide them with consumer projects or consumer project products. Therefore, together with the physiotherapy department of the Maastricht University Medical Center, we have developed an application in which both the patient and the therapist receive the information coming from the activity tracker. And in addition, the therapist can also use his version of the app remotely guide and adapt the exercise program of the patient. Finally, a summary of the physical activity status of the patient is uploaded to the electronic medical record so that next to the vital signs and the physical activity parameters are also available to all care professionals that are involved in the treatment of the patient. So not only the physiotherapist. At the Maastricht University Medical Center, this application is currently already integrated into standard daily care. And a specific need that both end user groups have in common is that the actual that actually their physical activity level is very low. Therefore, for to measure uh, increases at this low level of activity is very important that the physical activity algorithms are very accurate in detecting, for instance, also the shuffling of the patients. For both the development and maybe even more important, the validation of these specific uh, algorithms, we work closely together with the Department of Human Movement Sciences at the Maastricht University. On the one hand, they provide the biomechanical reasoning behind the algorithms, and on the other hand, their human of their human performance lab allows for the validation of these algorithms in a simulated free living situation, as opposed to simple lab testing. Now, before I will also tell you a little something about our own department, let me conclude this section about the MIS activity and the hospital fit application with some nice results obtained with these applications. First of all, the following graphs show that the error in classification, classifying the physical behavior with the MOX activity uh, application is much better than with uh, other activity trackers like the active Paul and the Fitbit. And secondly, for the hospital fit application, an effect study showed that the use of the hospital fit application resulted in patients standing and walking for an average increase of almost 30 minutes, and that their odds of functional recovery were almost three times higher. Now, where are we located? We are part of the Brightland Maastricht Health Campus. Actually, we are part of the Faculty of Health Medicine and Life Sciences. Furthermore, the, com the campus also consists of the Maastricht University Medical Center, this is a very important partner in developing new innovative applications for and implementing them into daily care so that they can become beneficial to patients. Furthermore, the campus houses also a lot of companies, for example, Maastricht Instruments. In our case, this company makes the hospital fit and the MIS activity application available for commercial use. And other uh, relevant local partners are the Faculty of Sciences and Engineering, this because of their data science experience, and the Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience, for example, for their expertise on the user, accept, uh, user acceptance of our developments. Our department itself is called ID, which is actually Dutch word for ID. ID, ID stands for Instrument Development engineering and evaluation, where the engineering part often refers to the technical smart system integration and the evaluation refers 
to the validation of the total application in which this technology is used. Important to mention is that we are not a scientific department. Our focus is not on research, but applying knowledge and technology for the benefit of patients, people that often have special needs. Commercially wise, this is a relatively small, a small market as compared to a consumer market. At our department, we have several focus areas. However, the one relevant for today's topic is that of the wearable healthcare. We have a modular measurement and data management platform operational for the fast development of um, wearable healthcare uh, application prototypes. This for cl clinicians and researchers within the Maastricht Univers University Medical Center to enlarge their medical scientific knowledge, but also together with companies make this available for validated care applications inside and outside our campus. The core of our modular measurement platform consists of a proprietary data acquisition unit. Within projects, we can then easily integrate technology from other scientific and industrial partners. In previous projects, for example, we have connected flexible batteries and textile breathing sensors to our platform. In some products of some projects, we look for technology that is needed for the use case that we are working on. In another project, we help to find a use case for the technology that a partner wants to demonstrate within a project. Complete a use case, the prototype of the measurement device is then maybe together with other devices also integrated into our modular data management platform and some, sometimes also connected to other IT infrastructures. Both for specific use cases and for general data management, data management platform features, we like to work together with partners, for example, in the field of edge AI and also security. And that's all what I wanted to tell you now. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that we can work closely together in the future on smart systems to be active and also healthy. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Mr. Arts. Our next speaker, Professor Niu Savate, is the principal investigator of the research group at the Institute of Microelectronics of Barcelona, IMB CNM, and will talk about self powered strategies for monitor health. We are looking forward to your presentation, Ms. Savate. We start now with our questions and answers panel, and I ask all speakers to turn on their cameras. So, may you start, Mr. Günstler? Yes, thank you. Well, we are a little bit out of time, but I think we should have uh, take the time to have at least one question per presentation. I start with Jan. Uh, there I got the questions. What are the challenges of consistent breath sampling? Which is uh, the gas sensing principle used in the COVID detection attempts? Okay, th these are two questions. And, and um, so, um, uh, first of all, on the technology, we have um, uh, within the different uh, systems, different kind of sensors employed. The um, um, uh, A lot of the times we're using the gold nanoparticle sensors that developed by the Technion, as Hassam Haik is one of our core partners that we're working with. And the advantage of these sensors is that they are, uh, mm -hmm. they are trimmed towards um, um, VOCs in breath uh, and they're low yeah. power. Uh, and fairly um, fairly low cost. Uh, the other technology that we have, um, other te technologies that uh, we have been employing are optical sensors, our metal oxide gas sensors. So we are also using standard off the shelf commercial sensors, but academic sensors for benchmarking in the same systems. So we have been we have been doing multi sensor systems for those things. Now the challenge with um, with breath analysis and and sampling the breath, there are a couple of things that are important here. Uh, one of the problems for a lot of chemical gas sensors is that the humidity levels are fairly high, uh, which means that if you are if you exhale breath, the the uh, temperature of the air 
is at body temperature or just slightly below and it's saturated with humidity <clears throat> so there's a lot of water in your exhaled breath which can form droplets uh, in fluidic systems and block pathways and if as soon as you have droplets uh, droplets uh, also VOCs especially polar VOCs uh, are being absorbed in the water and not accessible to the chemical sensors anymore so there is uh, a certain amount of uh, technology involved to avoid that um, that problem and the other thing is that uh, depending on how the way you are sampling the breath if you're exhaling breath if you're exhaling towards the system you need to identify when the breath is really starting what part of the breath you want to sample are you interested in the upper part of the respiratory system are you interested in the in the lungs in the end tidal part that that means that you need to adapt your sampling systems towards the use case and that's what we have been doing within the different systems that we have been doing so that's just a short summary there's a lot more to talk about of course thanks a lot uh, the next question goes to Lucas. Uh, actually, there are also two questions. Uh, one is about the power consumption. Um, how do you deal with uh, battery life and weight, and uh, especially heat dissipation so close to the head of the user? And mm -hmm. also concerning the user, uh, is this retinal scan inherently safe? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> maybe come to the first uh, to the first question: power consumption and, and heat dissipation. Um, in the end, uh, uh, how to say the whole product setup depends on product layout depends on the user case. So uh, it's different to say I I'm, I'm I want immersive AR game uh, for two hours. Then you have a totally different uh, uh, application. They have a lot of content, a lot of of how to say the picture is really full, where, where all pixels of the display are really on. Whereas for a digital companion to support you in, in uh, uh, doing something for your health, doing sports, remind you uh, as a digital assistant or, or during cycling or your yoga lesson, it's more like okay, um, you, you get occasional uh, uh an input and the input will be not a full will be not a full uh, uh color uh picture um which is covering the reality but it will be a little bit of text for a couple of seconds maybe and then it's it's this uh, disappearing again similar to smartwatches and so the today's power consumption um <clears throat> We believe that today's power consumption is enabling a use case as a companion where you have uh, phases of on and phases of off uh, and where you are showing only a little bit of content so less is more in the end so to not distract the user but to enhance with oh there is uh, please stand stand up and, and move a little bit or I don't know take the left uh, right when you are cycling or oh uh, maybe you you uh, you need a rest I don't know something like that and so for these kind of applications today power consumption will enable a form factor smart glasses with an all-day uh, operation so the battery is lasting all day and you will stay below the magic of 50 or 60 gram all in all uh, when you calculate it similar to the user case of a, of a recent smartwatch um, of course when you start to do immersive AR, when you put more and more in, then the demands will uh, will, will increase the power efficiency demands, um, and and will uh, how to say demand for for next generations, um, and the same for heat dissipation. Uh, so our our own prototypes, uh, which we are using for for UX studies, have no issue with heat dissipation because you are not constantly powering a full bright white image in, but you are showing info this uh, information, then it's off again, then it's on again, then it's off again. So this is the answer for the first question. Um, totally, the other question: Retina scan inherently safe? Yes, it is. It's far below. Uh, today's limits, but I, let me explain it in another way. Uh, to overlay the retina, to overlay the reality which is uh, uh, which is seen by the retina with a picture, uh, brings 
not another radiation, not a higher radiation level to the retina compared to the level which you have by looking into the environment. Uh, so otherwise it will uh, be like a flash or uh, it, it will disturb you totally. And so yes, the retina scan technology is inherently safe because you are talking here about microwatts, single digit microwatts, what you are need as output. The LED which is flashing uh, at, at, a, at a toy uh, is, brings much higher exposure to the retina than a dedicated retina scan display device. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I do one. Uh, I do have one question to Christoph. You showed us a lot of um, uh, possibilities for parameters, a lot of devices. Did you think already, because you do that all in CSM together, did you think already on compatibility? Um, well, my experience is that for a lot of these gadgets, you need to have a, a different um, app and this makes uh, already in a normal household life a little bit complicated oh, a nap for the debate a nap for the uh, blood pressure and so on yeah so um actually we don't do products ourselves we we develop technology and we transfer technology so what you've seen is actually um all the technology most of them are already in products uh, if we take like uh, the, the AVA uh, fertility tracker, which I mentioned for the respiration rate, we actually, they wanted to do their own uh, uh, fertility tracking and they needed a lot of features to do that. And uh, we helped them select the features and then we gave them all the, um, the algorithm. So what we did is we helped them to implement the technology. I mentioned the hardware, the electronic, also uh, the, the algorithms that are embedded and the algorithm in the cloud. But of course, each use case then need uh, its own application. Uh, but this is not in our hands. We enable that. Sometimes we do apps for our customers, but uh, let's say, to be honest, we are also engineers. So we cannot do a, an app which will look nice and which anybody can use. Uh, so we kind of, stay on our place and uh, do the technology and let the other people do the user interface and, and something nice. Thanks a lot, Christoph. <laughs> well, um, we have only two, three minutes left. Uh, two questions for yours. Can you tell us a bit more about how do you charge your monitoring device? Um, which power do you, uh, can you apply? Um, and also, um, but made the patient move or exercise more? Was it the use of the system as such or the follow-up it enabled? And did you consider including a, uh, something like a gamification? Sorry, what was your last sentence? Did you consider already um, to do it in a playful way, um, meaning gamification? Yeah, well, I think we are engineers and engineers there as well. But, uh, well, most of the devices are battery operated. So we use, uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, the people walk around with it. So in our modular platform, we also dimension the size of the battery uh, related to the application, whether it only has to work for one day or if you want to monitor uh, a whole week and uh, we can adapt the caps capacity of the battery to that um, then indeed uh, for the effect i think for the hospital fit application it's a combined effect uh, it's both the uh, the fact that you can measure the activity level but also the awareness or the uh, the fact that you are a physiotherapist is looking at your results together with you not in a not to control you but to support you this um, this also helps in getting people more active so it's always a combination of the technology but also the way it is used it just creates also maybe more awareness than when you're at home and you know that you have to do your physiotherapist uh, 
uh, exercises. Um, but then maybe sometimes you forget. And for gamification, um, I think that depends on the um, the target population as well. Uh, the, for instance, for the MIS activity, which is usually usually for more uh, older adults, um, of course they also want to play games, maybe uh, to stay young. Uh, but it's it's a completely different uh, application than for uh, really young people. So there it was really dedicated to the information that they wanted in that situation. Thank you. Um, a final question to, to the lady. I, I will not pr pronounce your name because I will do it wrong. Nails. <laughs> um, you showed us nice applications which do fit to the power you have um, available. But for a more long-term view, have you an idea on what capacity you could get out of such um, such um, paper batteries? Oh, well, uh, in fact, it's a, a question of dimensioning the electrodes. The thicker the electrodes, the more you time you, you operation you have. But we are focused on single-use short-term applications because okay. as it is a primary battery, you have to get rid of uh, the byproducts that the battery generates. And at some point, it, it ends up uh, not functioning well as a sensor, I would say. Okay. But yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. So finally, thanks a lot to all of you for quite nice presentations, very interesting presentations. Um, and I will give now back um, for the lunch break, I guess. So. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Ginsler, and thanks to all our panelists. And for the large number, also thank you from the questions from the audience. We take now our lunch break and meet again at 13.40. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.